I couldn't help but focus on one of the most deeply disturbing passages in the Bible today, but I felt it would be tough to ignore it. So, the binding of Isaac. Um, I will not try to excuse or explain away how deeply problematic it is. Terrifying, really. Um, If God told any of us to sacrifice our son, um, that would be problem enough. But uh, the man uh, God asked to um, do this was, uh, happened to be the, the, the father of the nation of Israel that God had already promised to create so many descendants that it would be like uh, sand on the seashore or stars in the sea or stars in the sky. So God had already kind of been leading them up to this. You're going to be a great nation and your son's going to be the one to do it. And then to make that possible, His wife was already 80, 90, 100 years old. He was 100, how many knows, years old. God miraculously uh, makes Isaac possible in the first place. And then to ask him to give up uh, that son makes no sense at all. It's like he even led him up more to that. Um, It's terrifying. It's called the binding of Isaac. Muslims refer to it instead as the sacrifice and actually they think it's Ishmael. The difference right between binding and sacrifice is that Isaac wasn't too into this idea either, right? It's terrifying. Now I can say uh, that it had sort of a happy ending, right? Isaac did escape. I'm not sure how he felt about his dad afterwards or about God. But if there is some lesson to be learned, so that God does not require or desire the sacrifice of our children. There probably would have been a better way to teach that lesson. As Christians, we can't help but make a connection between Isaac and Jesus. Um, Jews for centuries have connected Mount Moriah with Jerusalem. Um, Jesus is God's only son. Isaac and Jesus both carrying the wood that would serve as the means of their sacrifice. But think, it's kind of messes with your head because now God's very self is putting God's self in submission to a different type of will. If Abraham was completely obedient to the divine will, God decided, impossibly, to put God's self in submission to human will. obviously, um, and predictably, right, uh, the divine will um, was thwarted. Because what, would, what, what did God hope for when God sent Jesus down into this world? That people would hear him and, and respond accordingly, right? Say, look, this is the fullest picture we know yet of who God is in this world. To follow him and to begin to create with God this beloved community that God dreamed of. And we know that didn't happen. So, in the second case, in the second story, God's will was disobeyed. Through violence, through disobedience. But God does not require that. God did not require that of Jesus. God does not require that of any of us. And perhaps if there is any way to try to understand how we found that binding of Isaac's story in the Bible in the first place, in a time when there was child sacrifice, is that God said, you know what? This isn't who I am. This is not what I require. But it is dangerous, and Jesus knows us better than all of us. It is dangerous to be subject to this world. Subject not only to the natural laws of space and time, but especially to each other. Laurel and I recently went to a conference and met a woman, one of the the presenters who shared this story with us. She grew up in rural Mississippi. And her brother, who was eight, um, said he had a stomach ache. 
his, their family were sharecroppers, and um, you know, the first day they didn't really pay attention to it, maybe had a home rem remedy. Um, the second day they started to be a little bit more concerned, and by the third day it was still bothering him, even getting worse, and so they decided to take him to the local hospital. And the hospital said, sorry, um, we don't serve you. And by that time it was urgent, it was serious, and despite their pleading, they said, the hospital for you is about 100 miles away. And so these, this poor family did the best they could to get to that hospital. Um, but by the time they did, they couldn't um, solve the septic shock of, of a burst appendix. And so that um, brother of hers died when he was eight. Um, subject to um, humans deciding over centuries that it would be all right to say that some people got access to the care they needed and some people did not. Yes, it is dangerous to be a part of this world. But it wouldn't be church if I wasn't here to remind you of the other side of that coin. And surely God wouldn't have put us here in the first place if it was only dangerous to be subject to human free will. There's a beauty, there's a possibility among, among us and within us. It can be harder to remind ourselves of that, though, right? It's a lot easier to remind ourselves of, of the sad stories, the suffering, the pain that we can cause each other. But what if we remind ourselves more often that in these moments left we have when we are breathing, that we are invited into something great. And that God needs us in that. As crazy as this plan sounds, it seems that God has sent us to together do something about this injustice in the world. It's almost like God says, okay, I mean, and I know there's miraculous interventions and those sort of things too, but if you watch what happened with Jesus, God kind of says, okay, work it out, I've got, I'll figure it out after death, right? Starting with Jesus, like, I got you covered, but y'all need to figure it out now. Okay, we can do this, right? And we have, and we can think of those times that humans really do transcend their limitations, when they really do live out of the image of God that is imprinted upon them. But I think it really starts for us with an act of discernment. There's the divine will and there's a the human will. And that divine will is that all of creation may thrive. All of creation, every person may thrive. And too often than not, humans like to limit who really should thrive. So that act of discernment, perhaps, perhaps we all are a part of some Abrahamic test to figure out where is God working within this? And will we have the courage when we notice what the real divine will is to act on it? Fortunately, we don't have to do it by ourselves. God has given us the resources we need, starting with this physical creation. We have enough. We have enough. We have enough. It's hard to remember that. By giving us Jesus as a model, a path to follow into that right living. And then, and then through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, even the, the hope, the possibility that even whatever happens on this side of the veil, it's still going to be all right, that God's love lasts even past that time. And then a Holy Spirit that activates and energizes us, inspires us, makes it possible for us to work together across race, class, culture, language, privilege, to do great things together. Impossibly, right? Impossibly. We have enough. This woman whose brother died, 
at age eight, understandably grew up fighting the prospect of a life of bitterness and cynicism. She did all she could to get as much education as she could to, to protect herself from what happened to her family and to her brother. She said her dad never could get over the tragedy of that. She got a PhD in sociology and psychology, spent 30 years teaching college students about race and privilege and power. Dr. Catherine Meeks has written books. She's currently the founder of a new center in Atlanta called the Center for the Beloved Community, starting to imagine together what's next in this process that takes too long to dismantle racism. And I couldn't help but think of what the work that she did didn't have something to do with my visit this week to the brand new Kaiser Hospital. I don't know if anyone has seen it yet. In Claremont Mesa, it even has these like cool like blue lights inside, um, just as you're walking down the hallway. To be the first person um, outside Abuk and Tiap to hold Dang, our newest member of the St. Luke's family. And if you've been paying attention, you now know that there are two Dangs that are three weeks apart who will be growing up in this community. And some of the best medical care this world could offer that this family who so recently lived in a different country and flee, fleed it to arrive in a place that is trying its best to provide them hospitality and a new life. Over a span of some 60 years, there has been progress. There is possibility that we humans together, with God's help, can make a difference. And can you imagine the days and weeks and years that Dr. Catherine Meeks struggled herself through that process, a struggle to sustain any semblance of hope that she could even trust a white person? God's will is that all creation may thrive. Sometimes human will coincides with that, too often it tries to undercut that will. May we have the courage to notice what the divine will is and to follow it until that day at Christ's coming when the divine will will finally be made plain and impossible to ignore.